rest of us, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5 is where we will be this morning. We started a new series a couple of weeks ago, The Joy of God's Design, putting a little pause on our series in Genesis and thought it was necessary uh, to, to take some texts in Scripture and see how uh, really God's design is not only true, but it's also good. We've, we've kind of established that over the last couple of weeks. Uh, one, of, one of the biggest criticisms uh, of Christianity, and again, not that we respond to all the criticisms of Christianity. We have a firm foundation in who we are in Jesus. But one of the criticisms of Christianity in our modern culture is not just that it's untrue, but that it's actually bad for society, that our sexual ethic, that uh, the way that we live, our view of marriage, our view of the family, our view of suffering, our view of uh, eternal life, our view of, of everything, of morality, is actually uh, bad. That's, that's a fairly new thing to our, our society in this nation. That, that's always been, for the last 2,000 years, true of the church, how the culture, the society sees the church. But as far as our nation in this cultural moment that you and I live in, it's a fairly new concept. So one of the things we want to do is to see how God's design is actually for our joy. It's actually for our good. Uh, so we started off with Psalm 34, 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in Him. So we saw that God Himself is good. Not only true, but good. And therefore, because he is good, his commands are good. And that's what we looked at last week in Psalm 19. God's commands are not burdensome. It's not as if the law, God gave the law and then changed his mind later on. Like, oh, actually, that, those aren't good commands. Let me, let me do something different. Uh, what, what happened is the law is actually good and right and perfect. W what isn't is you and I. That's why the, the law couldn't save, because you and I are broken, messed up sinners. Uh, in the spiral of brokenness, as we've talked about in Genesis. And so Christ had to come in and fulfill the law for us. And now, as followers of Jesus, if you're in Christ, the law and obedience is actually for your good. We've talked a lot about this. Jesus died for our justification, to make us right before God. But he also died for our sanctification, to make us holy, so that you and I would walk in obedience to him. And it's important that we understand that. And now, over the next three weeks, I want us to look at some areas of contention. So we're taking the ideas that we've, we've already talked about from Psalm 34 and Psalm 19, and we're going to uh, kind of face head-on some cultural ideas because this is where, again, the Bible uh, is, is relevant for, for every cultural moment. Uh, the Bible isn't true because it's relevant. It's relevant because it's true. And so that's important that we, that we grasp that. And so we're going to look at some of the areas of contention within our culture that says these things cannot be good and therefore that Christianity is not good. Because you and I make some exclusive claims. And so we're going to look at these three areas, marriage and family. That's what we're looking at today. Our, our culture has, uh, our society has a negative view of the Christian worldview, the Christ-centered view of marriage and family. Next week, we'll look at gender and sexuality. We're going to kind of take that. So even though we're looking at marriage today, we'll go uh, deeper into gender and sexuality and why God's design for gender and sexuality is not only true, but also good. It's for our joy. And then in a couple of weeks, we'll look at suffering, why God's design for suffering is good. And you may be thinking, how is God's good design for suffering and for our joy? You've got to come again in two weeks to, to hear that. So that's not what we're doing today. Marriage and family, gender and sexuality, and suffering. Here's one of the primary things that our world says about marriage. So, again, we're going to zero in, and that's why we're in Ephesians 5, a very familiar passage. We're going to zero in uh, on, on marriage and, and how that affects the family. And Again, I say marriage and family. We're mostly centralizing, focusing on marriage because I think that's really the foundation for the family. And one of the primary pieces of advice our world gives about marriage is to find someone who makes you happy. Right? How often have we heard that? How often do we hear that from movies? We talked about that in the first week, right? I, I think the reason why I'm talking about cultural ideas such as movies and songs is because I think those things shape us more than, than any kind of government does. Art, uh, 
uh, shapes you and I. You and I are shaped by what we watch and think about and listen to. We become what we behold. We talked about that uh, last year in one of our series in 2 Corinthians. And, and so as you and I behold and become, or as we uh, behold these things, as we listen to these things, we become more like this. For example, let's take uh, one of the top songs of 2020, uh, a song called Falling by Trevor Daniel. Here's, here's kind of the famous line from that. Come closer, I'll give you, I'm not going to wrap this by the way of saying it. Come closer, I'll give you all my love. If you treat me right, baby, I'll give you everything. So this is, this is kind of the cultural ideas, right? This cultural moment that says, if you do this, if you initiate love, if you treat me right, then I will love you. You see, you see how culture becomes, uh, begins to shape us? Then we take one of the top songs of 2017, That's What I Like, by Bruno Mars. Uh, he, he does this. After listing off a number of things uh, that his wife or girlfriend, whoever he's talking about, likes to do, he says, lucky for you, that's what I like. And that line repeats itself. Lucky for you, that's what I like. And that's what our culture, that's, those aren't just a couple of isolated songs. That's kind of the general overall cultural view of love, that it's about me first and foremost. And if you want to join in, uh, then, then sure, let's go for it. But it talks about you looking for purpose and satisfaction and design in yourself. That's self-actualization or self-fulfillment. But Christ-centered marriage is fundamentally different, as self is not the ultimate good. We believe as followers of Christ, the self is broken and not the ultimate good being. Many have the view, I'm sorry, I'm adjusting, I know, but many have the view that God is withholding something good from us in marriage as if he wants us not to have joy and delight. But ultimate joy is not found in self, as we have already established. Ultimate joy is going to be found in God and God alone. So we want to simultaneously, here as we look at Ephesians 5, answer two questions. We're going to kind of, again, not go in order, but we're going to answer these two questions as we walk through this passage. One, what is marriage? And the second question is, is God's design for marriage both true and good? So we're going to simultaneously try to answer those questions as we look at this passage together. So before we do that, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how it invades our cultural ideas of love and marriage. God, I pray that you would help us have a right, biblical, biblical Christ-centered, gospel-centered view of marriage. Make us a people that see the joy in your design for marriage and the family, the joy in, in your design of how it points us to the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would give us a right view of who you are and whose we are. Lord, give us humility. I know marriage is a tense subject. Many people don't like to think on their own marriage or think about some of the implications of different roles of wives and husbands. Lord, I pray that you would humble us. You would help us examine our own hearts and learn to love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians 5 is where we will be. This is God's idea of marriage. I am no expert on marriage. You can ask my wife. She'll be the first one to tell you that I am no expert on marriage. Uh, but this is why we go directly to God's, God's view of marriage. God is the designer. So back in August of last year, as we've been in our Genesis series, walking through Genesis, uh, we looked at Genesis 2 and saw uh, God's uh, uh, design for marriage. God saw when God created marriage. And now we see Ephesians 5, where Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, really opens up for us what marriage is all about. Uh, in Ephesians, again, he establishes the gospel. This is where we kind of have to pick up some of the context. He establishes what the gospel is, and then he gives some practical implications of it. <clears throat> and before he gets into this part about marriage in verse 22, uh, he says this in verse 21. Ephesians 5, look at verse 21. Uh, he says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So he's talking about within the context of the church. This is really interesting, by the way, because uh, you and I tend to think of marriage and family as a, a private thing. This is between me and my wife. This is between us. This is between our household. No one else has any business in this. But Paul's not writing to individual marriages, is he? He's writing to the church. 
This is not a private matter. He's writing to the church so that they would hold one another accountable in marriage. You and I, as the church, as the body of Christ, one of the things we're committing to is to hold one another accountable, including in our marriage and in our family life. So that if we are out of step, we're going to see this as we walk through, if we are out of step with being a Christ-centered husband or a Christ-centered wife, the church is to hold us accountable for that in love and in grace. This is not a finger, and every time you mess up, we're going to hold you accountable. But the church is to lovingly call us into the roles that God has designed us for. Because we believe that there are roles. We are what is called complementarian, which means separate roles, separate but equal, right? Women and men have different roles. We'll talk more about that too as we look at gender and sexuality next week. Men and women have different roles, equal in status, but different. As opposed to egalitarian, which says there's no such thing as gender roles. We are not egalitarian. We don't believe the Bible is that. Either it's complementarian. And so that's where Paul begins this. Look at verse 22. Wives, Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. There's a (laughs) non-heated issue, right? This is an idea that our culture definitely does not like. And I want to make the claim that this is not only true, it's true because it's in God's Word, but it's also good for us. And I believe God's, God's design shows that it is good for us. He begins first by uh, speaking to wives. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Don't worry. Wives, we're going to get to your husbands here in a little bit. But this is specifically for wives. Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. The first thing that we see here uh, is, is that it says, as to the Lord. Remember, the, the verse prior to this, because we have to take this in context, says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So this is about obedience to Jesus. So this is where we have to connect kind of what we've talked about already. We, we established last week in Psalm 19 that obedience to Jesus is a good thing. Did we not? It's sweeter than honey. God's commands are actually good for us. It's like the warnings are like, don't touch that fire because it's going to burn us. Remember these examples from last week? And it's also like, hey, we're not going to stop at McDonald's to get the, the okay ice cream. We're going to go to a better place to get better ice cream. Right? These are what God's warnings and promises are for. And so if God's warnings and promises are good, this is where we have to have a a completely biblical view, then this command is good. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. So the question is not, because I know already what some of you wives may be thinking, well, what if my husband isn't a man worthy of submitting to? I've heard that question many times. But the question, because of where Paul places this, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, is not, is my husband worthy, but is Jesus worthy? That's the foundational question, wives, that you have to begin to think through. Not, is my husband worthy, but is Jesus worthy? I think a lot of women are turned off to this idea because they think it's just about their husband, but it's actually about obedience to Jesus. It's like this in anything that the Bible tells us, right? We don't just say, well, it's about the thing. We say it's about the one behind the thing. And that's Jesus. Jesus is the one behind all those commands. He's saying, come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. How do we come to him? By obedience, by trusting in him, by resting in him. He gives us rest. So this is actually for our good. This is for our flourishing. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And by the way, notice who Paul is speaking here to. He's speaking to the wives, not to the husbands. So husband, if you use this as ammo, you are using this scripture incorrectly. This is not ammo to shoot your wife down, to make her feel bad for not submitting to you. This is a direct command to wives to willingly submit to their husbands. That's an important, an important thing to get. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Notice it says your own husbands. This is not all men, but their own husband. I think a lot of men have abused this. I've seen women kind of a second class 
This is talking about just directly to your own husband. This is talking about within the context of that marriage. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. And this is a good thing, by the way, is it not? I mean, God started, think about how God started marriage. In Genesis 2, verse 18, God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. I love even the the idea Matthew Henry, a Puritan commentator, points out that God, notice God didn't take something out of Adam's head to put Eve above him and didn't take something out of Adam's foot to put Eve below him, but something out of his side, his rib, to be a helper, to walk side by side with him. It's an important concept that we grasp. This is what marriage is, and we believe and this is a, 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 it could be becoming more and more a, a radical, bold claim in our culture. We may get shut down on Facebook for this. Who cares? I don't care. Uh, man, a marriage is between one man and one woman for one lifetime. God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, right? This is, this is a biblical view of marriage. is a heterosexual, one man, one woman, in covenant relationship under God for one lifetime. That's God's design for marriage, and it is good. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and his, himself its Savior. What does it mean that the husband is the head of the wife, right? People have issues with that. Again, some people chalk this up. There's many churches who've abandoned this idea and have said, well, that was just a cultural thing because in a, a Greco-Roman society... Uh, that's just how it was. So Paul was writing into a Greco-Roman society. And there's a, a Greek word I like to call, say for that, baloney. <clears throat> it's not really a Greek word. All right. And we know this because Paul is basing it all the way back in creation. And Paul, Paul does that. He's going to speak all the way back to creation. And he's also going to show how this is a gospel issue. For example, in 1 Corinthians 11.3, he says this. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. We would probably agree with that. We'd say, yeah, Christ is the head of every man. The head of a wife is her husband. And some of us go, oh, wait. And the head of Christ is God. There's this building up here, right? The head of every man is Christ, and the head of Christ is God. We see those, those two statements, and most of us would probably, I think most Christians would agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. But then the one we don't like is the one sandwiched in the middle. The head of a wife is her husband. But notice where Paul puts this. He's saying if, if Christ is the head of a man, right, we have to look at how Christ treats mankind. And if the head of Christ is God, how does God the Father treat God the Son? To then find our pattern for if man is the head of the wife, how, does, how should man treat his wife? This is a loving relationship. Or again, we're going to see this here. We're going to get to this in a moment. But this is focusing specifically now on wives. For the husband, is, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. So now Paul begins to show how this is really a mystery. This marriage is not about you and I. This is one of the reasons why Christians are so staunch on marriage. And, and as long as I'm pastor here, we will be staunch on our view of marriage. It's not changing. God hasn't changed it for thousands of years now. We're not going to change either. God's view of marriage is a gospel issue. It's based in the gospel. We're not talking about a secondary or tertiary issue here. This isn't talking about, well, when does the millennial reign happen? This isn't talking about when does the rapture happen, right? Those, those are issues that aren't as clear in Scripture that you and I can disagree on and still be in fellowship, and we're going to be in heaven together no matter what because of Christ, no matter what our belief is on that. This is a gospel issue. This goes deeper than that. Look where Paul begins to put it. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Christ is the one who directs the church. He's the one who lovingly leads the church. So the pattern we have to look to is how does Jesus lead the church? Verse 24, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And we have to, we have to kind of remember what, what Paul's talking about here. We have to remember the context. He already said, as to the Lord, back in verse 22. So this does not mean following your husband into sin. 
One of the things that we can write off about submission is this does not mean blind obedience to everything that your husband leads you to. If it's as to the Lord, that means he, that man that, that assumes that that man, your husband, is being led by the Lord. If he's leading you into sin, you have biblical grounds to not walk into that sin. Your obedience, your allegiance is to Jesus before it is to your husband. As the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands, in everything, to their husbands. So we have to ask a couple of questions. One, should the church submit to Jesus? Yeah, we would agree with that. Absolutely. We want to be a Christ-centered, Jesus-centered church. So then the following, the follow-up question to that, because Paul puts it in the same sentence, is then should wives submit to their husbands? And yes. I think one of the schemes of Satan is to make wives think they are missing out. And this isn't new. This goes all the way back to the garden. Remember when we were in Genesis chapter 3? And one of the, part of the curse, right? Uh, God goes through the curse for the man and for the woman and for the serpent. Part of the curse of the woman is that she would desire the place of her husband. And that there would be this strife. It wasn't meant to be this way, right? Like marriage was a good thing designed to reflect God. Marriage was the, fir- the only thing before the fall to not be called, to be not good, or sorry, rather, when Adam was alone, it was the only thing that was called not good. And then so Adam uh, was, was made a helper for him by God, Eve. And so marriage was meant to be this picture of, of Jesus and his church all the way back from the beginning. And so Satan begins to tempt us to think that wives somehow in submission are missing out. Again, it's not blind obedience. It's not doing whatever your husband says you should do. It's not saying, leave your brains at the altar. That's not what submission means. But it does mean trusting his authority, being willing to be led. If if your husband, and again, there's a lot of complicated issues that go into marriage, I realize that. But maybe, and again, I'm going to get to husbands here in a minute, maybe one of the reasons why we see so many men not willing to lead their families because wives haven't allowed them to. I'm not saying that's the case for your marriage, but it's one of the things you have to think about, wives. This is where humility comes in. Both sides has to be humble. We have to look, am I willing to be led? And I know I'm putting myself in your place. This is not a question I ask myself. But am I willing to be led by my husband? One of those questions we have to begin to ask, am I willing to let him lead me and to lead us spiritually. And we're going to talk about what that leadership looks like here in a minute. But am I willing to submit? Because you know who else submitted? Jesus. Jesus submitted to the Father. He was willing to be led by the Father. So not only are wives representing the church and how the church is to submit to Christ, wives also are representing Jesus, who willingly humbled himself and lowered himself for a time submitting himself to the will of the Father. I mean, think about even in the Garden of Gethsemane as he's praying and sweating drops of blood. He says, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Submission is a thing we all have to do, by the way. This isn't only for wives. The Bible says to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You and I, as the church, are submitting to one another. We submit. We live in a nation where you and I are called to submit to our governing authorities. You can't just go as fast as you want on the roads or go and rob a bank, or go and shoot someone just because you want to. There's authorities that you and I are called to submit to. You can't just come into a church and do whatever you want and believe whatever you want. You're submitting to authority. You and I, all of us are called to submit, and so submission is a good thing. God designed it to be that way. Wives should submit to everything in their husbands. Now, he gets to the part about husbands. Verse 25, husbands... Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Let's stop there for a minute. Notice the first thing 
Because the, the idea, what Paul is getting at, is that husbands are to lead. But he doesn't start off with husbands lead your wives. Look what he starts off with. Husband, love your wives. The first mark of leadership is love. You know why we have so much bad leadership in our society today? Because there's such a lack of love. Jesus makes that really clear. That all the law and the prophets are summed up by love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And if we don't start there, then none of the other commands will go your way. Husbands, and now I'm beginning to talk to husbands, if you, if you demand submission from your wife and have not love, you are functionally acting as an atheist. You are functionally saying, I like God's morality, but I don't like the God of the morality. Husbands are called to love their wives. That's the first mark of leadership. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. I love this quote by uh, Andreas Kostenberger in his book, God, Marriage, and Family. He says, while some may view submitting to one's husband's authority as something negative, a more accurate way of looking at marital roles is to understand that wives are called, are called to follow their husband's loving leadership. That's what marriage is designed for. You're willing to follow your husband's loving leadership as your husband follows Christ lovingly. Follow his loving leadership. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is a weighty command. And by the way, I think husbands have a weightier command throughout Scripture. We're going to look at a couple of passages. Because you're called to be leaders. God always holds his leaders more accountable. We see that throughout the history of Israel. We see that in the church. And we see that within the family. Men, God will hold you accountable for how you led your family. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus loved the church. How did he do that? By serving. Think about how he, how he loved the church. Think about how he led the church. Think about one of the, the primary pictures we should have of Jesus when we think of the Gospels. Jesus on his hands and feet, washing, uh, washing on his hands and knees, washing feet. Was there any doubt who the leader was at that moment? No. The disciples knew this is the leader. This is who I want to follow. They saw Jesus lovingly serve. That's what his leadership love looked like. Men, leadership does not look like sitting on your couch and demanding things of your wife. True leadership means going first. Going ahead. Think about, think about how, what God demands of his leaders. I think of Joshua. I think he's one of the, the greatest examples of leadership. When they cross the river and then when they go into battle, Joshua is not like our typical generals who kind of stand back and, you know, you like you watch a Civil War movie and all the generals are sitting back on a horse watching binoculars as their men are getting slaughtered. No, Joshua goes first. Joshua leads. He led the nation of Israel. And then at the end of his life, he led his family. He said, as for me, And my house, we will serve the Lord. There wasn't any question who was leading his family. There wasn't any question who his family was worshiping. I hope we can be like that, men. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. We go first. Jesus went first. Jesus is the first fruits. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, making her holy. That's that's Jesus' desire of the church. He would sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. How are we sanctified? How are we made holy as the church? By God's word. Our standard has to be this for everything. Our standard is not our government. Our standard is not even our statement of faith or our bylaws. Our standard is not our pastor's Our standard is the Bible. That's how you and I are sanctified. Jesus uses his word to cleanse us. Christ loved the church by serving her, dying for her, and making her holy. So if Christ cleanses his 
bride through the washing of the word, a godly husband should speak and model biblical truths for his wife. And therefore, if a husband is not doing this, he is acting as a functional atheist. Husband, we should be the one leading our wives and leading our families in devotions. One of the things I, I remember so much about my grandfather, I grew up with my grandparents, is that he was the one. I would wake up in the morning and he was always up, Bible open. He was the one who was taking us to church. There was no question what we were doing Sunday morning. He was the one driving. He was the one leading us to church. He was the one that before bed would pull out his Bible and begin to teach to read through scripture and to pray with us. He was the one who, as I sat next to you on a pew, would sing and lift his hands, and I was looking up and saw that. And I don't remember probably 90% of the things my grandfather taught. But I remembered his character. I remembered who he was. And he still is. He's still alive, by the way. And who he is. And what has formed him as a man. And how he led his bride and us to follow Jesus together. Cleansing her by the washing of the word. If Jesus cleanses his bride through the word husbands, we are called to lead our brides well. And by the way, if you're not married in here, men, this is, this is a biblical picture of how you're to lead your wives. Begin to set these things into place now. And maybe you've been married for a long time and haven't set these things into place. It's not too late to start over. That's what the gospel does. The gospel shows us great grace so that we can begin again. Jesus begins to renew and to restore families. And that's, that's my hope that we would see the joy of this, the joy of God's design. Verse 27, so that he might present the church. This is still talking about Jesus. <clears throat> he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. That's God's desire. That's Christ's desire for his bride to make her more holy. If that's Jesus' model for us, Husbands, how are you leading your wives? If your wife is less holy because of being married to you than she was before, you're not leading like Jesus. Your husband, your wife rather, should look more like Jesus through marrying you and vice versa. And you and I are called to follow, uh, to lead one another, to point each other to Christ, to follow Jesus together. That's what a marriage is meant to be, being changed, being conformed into the image of God, dying to ourselves. Marriage is not about you and I. Marriage is about the gospel, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Verse 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes, nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. I would make that case for anyone. You may say, well, what about suicide? Suicide were people who love their own bodies that they want to get away from suffering. And no one truly hates our own body. We do what we think is best. We talked about that last week. We do what we think is for the most good for us. It's what, that's what humans were designed for, which is why God's word shows that the best, what is truly best for you and I, as men and women, is God's design. We should take our ultimate joy here in the same way. Back to verse 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. This is a radically difficult command, by the way. In fact, I would argue it's impossible without Jesus. What's impossible with men is possible with God. Only Christ can do this. And this is a weighty command, men, husbands, because here's some of the things that the, the Bible says about what this love is supposed to look like. 1 Peter 3 7 says this Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. And here's the weighty command so that your prayers may not be hindered. There may be some husbands in here who've been praying about things for a long time and are wondering why their prayers are not being answered because you're not treating your wife in a Christ-centered way. That's it's God's word. That's not mine. Your prayers may be hindered because you're not living with your wife in an understanding way. First Peter 3.7 makes that clear. That's a weighty command. You may need 
men, you may need to put away the video games or the golf clubs or the car hobby or whatever else to focus on your, on your wife, to focus on your marriage. Because our world tells us the opposite. Our world says, do what makes you happy. Go after your career. Go after your hobbies and neglect your wife. Your first calling as a man is to your family. Don't neglect that. I told the elders when I first came here, and I still, uh, still buy this claim, that I love this church, and I will lead this church, and I will work hard, but if I get fired by spending too much time with my family or being, investing in my family too much, then I, I, I'm going to praise the Lord for that. My family will always come first. You get one family. It's your ultimate goal. That's our ultimate calling. If it takes quitting a job, I've seen men who have quit jobs, quit their lifelong careers in order to invest in their family. That's commendable. Don't quit your family to invest in your career. You weren't designed for a career. You were designed to love and to lead your wife. It's a picture of the gospel. You weren't designed for hobbies. As good as those things are, again, there's nothing wrong with careers or hobbies in and of themselves, but if they take you away from leading your family, your God-given duty of leading your family, then put those things to rest. Flee from those things. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And this is a good thing. Again, this is God's design for marriage, but our second question there is also... Is God's design for marriage both true and good? Proverbs 31.10, I think, makes that clear. Proverbs 31.10, an excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. What a verse to take to your boss. If your job is hindering your marriage, and you say, how are you going to make a living? How are you going to make money? My wife's more precious than jewels. My wife's more precious than a paycheck. I'm going to invest in her more than anything else. Husbands, lead your families like this. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Again, this is, this is where that unity of marriage comes in. This is where it's for our ultimate good. It's not just for the other person. It's also for you. What's best for you in the marriage is to self-sacrifice and give to your wife. What's best for your wife in a marriage is to self-sacrifice and to give to her husband. That's how marriage is designed to work. Think of, think of the greatest relationship in the universe, the Trinity. Right? I know it's one God in three persons. I have no idea fully how that works. But they're in perfect, loving community, willing to submit. God the Father leads and loves God the Son. God the Son submits. God the Spirit submits and points to Jesus. One God in three persons, this perfect, holy community. And marriage is to model that the community that God has within himself. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Verse 29, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Look, we, you and I spend a lot of time and energy on careers and bodies and other things, but we invest very little in our marriage. Think about the amount of time that we spend on our image, the amount of time we spend, again, in our careers, the amount of time that we spend on our bodies trying to get in shape or keep ourselves alive longer or take the right medicines and eat the right foods and all those things. Again, nothing in and of themselves that's wrong with those things. But if we neglect, begin to neglect our marriage, we're not nourishing and cherishing the thing that God has designed for us to cherish. And again, this is the, the, the leadership of the husband, to nourish and cherish. How does a, a husband lovingly lead his wife? By thinking of her needs first. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Husbands, your marriage is not to be served, but to serve. And to give your life for the sake of your wife. And many of us are willing to do that. I, and we hear husbands say that all the time. I'm willing to die for my wife. I'm willing to take a bullet for my wife. Yeah, but you're not willing to turn off a pornographic image for your wife. It's real easy to say something. It's another thing to actually do it. 
I'm not willing to sacrifice my career. I'll take a bullet for my wife, but I'm not willing to sacrifice my career goals. I'll take a bullet for my wife, but I'm not willing to give up my hobby. I'll take a bullet for my wife, but I'm not willing to give up my TV obsession. I'll take a bullet for my wife, but I'm not willing to give up X, Y, Z. Let's put our obedience where our mouth is. That's the gospel. That's what Christ has called us to. Christ did. He didn't just love us in, in word, but also in deed. He said, I'm going to love you, and then he actually did. He came and gave his life. Verse 30, because we are members of his body. This is, again, this is a church issue. The body of Christ, the church. We hold one another accountable as husbands and wives. Verse 31, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Paul here quotes Genesis 2. Again, he goes all the way back to the beginning. He goes back to the foundational issue of when marriage was designed. The two shall become one flesh. You and I are one as the body of Christ, but also you're one in your marriage. My wife and I are one, not two. Not two people chasing separate goals. Going after the same goal. To glorify Christ, to make much of Jesus. I think much of our brokenness within our marriages today is because we have two people who live separate lives and and chase two separate goals. I mean, think about that even practically, how you begin to do that in your life. And again, I don't want to just shame, I don't want to shame people, but we begin to think about, okay, if I'm one, what does that look like? Well, that practically looks like maybe putting our bank account together. Having one bank account. What's mine is yours, what's yours is mine. Talking about your goals and dreams, not chasing two separate things, two separate career aspirations. Like, I'm, I'm not saying that it's wrong for a, a wife to work outside of the home. That's not, that's not a biblical idea. At the same time, our world has sold us this lie that a woman's value is only found in as much as she can be like a man. So she has to go and chase career aspirations and goals and dreams. Because it has also sold men the, the lie that jobs is just about chasing aspirations and dreams. Both those things are lies. A career is meant to be provision for your family and glorifying God using whatever you've been gifted with. And men, you should be the providers. We're called to be the providers. The, the Bible actually says that a man who does not provide for his own household is worse than an unbeliever. It's a weighty, again, men have some weighty commands in Scripture when we begin to look at it. We have to begin to have a right view of men and women. This mystery, and then verse 32, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Marriage is about the gospel. Verse 33, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is all for our good. The wife's joy, because we're one flesh, one body. My wife's joy is also my joy. Husband, your wife's ultimate joy is your ultimate joy. Wife, your Husband's ultimate joy is your ultimate joy. Everything in marriage works better that way when you're thinking of the other person. Whether we're talking physically or financially or spiritually, everything in your marriage works better when you begin to think that way. I love the way Tim Keller says it in his excellent book, The Meaning of Marriage. When two people genuinely love each other and are not simply using one another for sex, status, or self-actualization, they don't want the situation to ever change. Each wants assurance of enduring commitment, and each delights to give those assurances. That's how marriage works best. That's the joy of God's design in marriage. It's not just that God's withholding something back from us, like, see, if you guys only knew what was waiting for you. No, he's actually given us the best thing. Every other form of quote-unquote marriage that our culture sees today is brokenness and is not for our good and joy. It's only going to lead to more and more chaos. I mean, just think about where this road that we are on. If we begin to say there's no rules in marriage, that marriage is not, if we define marriage other than anything else than what the Bible's defined it as, as a heterosexual relationship between a man and a woman for one lifetime, then there are no rules. Right? If marriage is, is just a concept of, of your own mind, and you get to define truth, what tells some 30-year-old predator that he can't marry a 10-year-old girl? 
Right? Who, who constitutes that? Who gets to determine that that is wrong? You see where this road leads that our society is on? Who says that you can't go and marry a tree or a dog or your car or whatever if, if truth and goodness is defined by you? Truth and goodness, truth and beauty are only defined by God. God is the ultimate source of truth. He's the ultimate source of beauty. And therefore, what he does and what he says is for our good. It's for our joy. And this mystery is really, again, about the gospel. John Piper, let me get my notes again. John Piper says it like this. I pray that we will all recognize in his book, the moment, This Momentary Marriage, another excellent book, I pray that we will all recognize the deepest and highest meaning of marriage, not sexual intimacy, as good as that is, not friendship or mutual helpfulness or childbearing or child rearing, rearing, but the flesh and blood display in the world of the covenant-keeping love between Christ and his church. It's what healthy marriages are meant to be. They're meant to lead to healthy families, the rest of Ephesians 6, or the first part of Ephesians 6 talks about that. It's meant to lead to men leading their families and women willingly submitting and following their husband's loving leadership. This is a biblical, Christ-centered, gospel-centered marriage. And it's, no, it's all about self-sacrifice, right? I love this, and we'll, we'll end here. John Stott says this, the wife's submission is but another aspect of love. What does it mean to submit? It is to give oneself up to somebody. What does it mean to love? So that's the wife's role. What does it mean to love? The husband's role is to give oneself up for somebody. You see that? Both of them, it's different aspects and may look differently, but ultimately the core issue is to give yourself up for the other person. Wives, because of Jesus, willingly submit to their love, their husband's loving leadership. Husbands loving, lovingly serve their wives as serving leaders. And that's what we are called to. Marriage is a gospel issue. Because in this way, both husbands and wives model Jesus for one another. And because of this connection, if we begin to tweak the biblical design of marriage due to cultural standards, then we are functionally saying that the gospel can be tweaked based on cultural standards. See how dangerous that road is? If marriage is really about the gospel and we say marriage can be changed, then we can also say the gospel can be changed. That's why this is a core issue. That's why we have a statement on marriage and our statement of faith. And we believe this is for our good. Marriage is meant to be a selfless picture of the gospel. It finds its foundation in Christ, who is our ultimate joy. So self-seeking, which is expressive individualism, in marriage leaves for a foundationless and therefore a joyless marriage. Of course people outside of Christ are going to have a lot of joyless marriages. Of course marriage is going to be seen as a, a bleak thing. Of course marriage is going to be made fun of. And men leading their families is going to be frowned upon and made fun of in all kinds of movies and sitcoms. Because without a foundation, there's no joy. Without Christ, the ultimate source of joy, there's no joy in that. We have to ask ourselves this question. Is Jesus the most happy being in the universe? Absolutely. Jesus is the most happy being in all of the universe. And does he find joy in leading his bride? Yes. The Bible makes that clear. Here in Ephesians 5, Hebrews 12, he endured suffering for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. It was for joy. And so because Jesus is the most joyful being in the universe, and because he rejoices in leading his bride, then marriage is for our joy. And nothing can take that joy away. That's, that's built for our goodness. For, that's built for our joy. Marriage is not just true. God's design for marriage is not just true, but it's also good. And again, that, I know that doesn't cover all the basis of marriage. There's a lot of complicated issues in that. But this is where we have to begin with God's word showing that it's for our good, and because it's a gospel issue. Jesus loved his church. He died for his church. He still leads his bride, and he is sanctifying her, making her holy, until he comes back one day and presents her to the Father, holy, spotless, blameless. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for your model in marriage, for how your design for marriage is both true but also good and that it's a gospel issue. It's not just about us. Our marriage is not just about 
our own self-actualization or self-fulfillment. Our marriage is meant to be a proclamation of the gospel to the world around us. So give us a right view of marriage. Give us a right view of our roles as husbands and wives. Help us to love and to lead our families well. God, I want to lead my family better. I want to serve my bride. Lead my kids to following after you. God, I pray that husbands in here would be willing to do the same. I pray that wives would willingly submit and follow the loving leadership of their husbands, modeling Jesus and his submission to you, Father. I pray that you would make us more like you. Give us a biblical view of this kind of marriage. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't think this is working, but remember, our marriage is not about, your marriage is not about you. It's about Christ. Christ purchased you with his blood so that your marriage would be a proclamation of the gospel. Like This is a living testimony to show to the world, this is how Christ loves his church, and this is how the church submits to Christ. So if one of those things is broken down, we begin to proclaim to the world a false gospel. That's a, that's a dangerous thing. And again, I, I don't want to guilt you with that. Maybe the Holy Spirit is, is really beginning to draw you back to repentance. That's a good thing. But there's grace for that. And if you think, ah, I failed, I've messed it up. That's where Christ begins to redeem our marriages. I've read stories and seen from friends I've known Christ redeem some of the most broken marriages. Christ can. So even if yours isn't, you don't think fully broken, but you need some tweaking, absolutely. We are, you and I are being sanctified. None of us are perfect. There's not a single husband, perfect husband in this room. There's not a single perfect wife in this room. We have to begin to scrub those, uh, those ideas of a perfect husband or a perfect wife out of our imagination. Only Christ is. So you and I should be constantly being changed being conformed to the image of Christ. Look to him. Proclaim him with your life and with your actions and see that God's design for marriage is not just for your, it's not just true, but it's also for your good, for your joy, so that you would relish Christ more. Ashley's going to pray us out. Uh, Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for bringing us all to he- here today, and um, thank you for the message that Zach gave us this morning. I just pray that you would be with us this week um, at home with our families and as we go about our daily lives. And I pray that you just keep us all safe today as we go through the afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen.